Hi, everybody. Hi, 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 hi. You guys good? Good day? Good summer? Feeling good? Inspired? Are you? Yeah? Like, what's most inspiring from what you've heard? Like, give me one word that, like, what's, what's, in, your, what's in your brain right now from a one-word standpoint? What? Inspiration. What else? Challenge. Like, no fear. What's that? Rewarding. What else? Jonathan? You are percolating a brilliant answer, I'm sure. It's going to happen over time. And over the... It, so give me more words. Life-changing. Life -changing. Nice. What about you, Austin? Uh, rich. Nice. Jennifer? Um, extraordinary. Extraordinary. Cool. So you guys just really kind of take a minute to reflect sometimes because you've heard some amazing inspiration from amazing people over the last few hours. And so this is one of those days you won't forget. And it's one of those, may, it may feel kind of a little bit forgetful right now, but it, later on in your life, I promise you, this will be one of those days you go, you know, I went to that TEDx Youth from James River High School, and it was about extraordinary, anonymous, anonymous extraordinaries. And, you know, I'm thinking I may be one now. And it may be five years from now, or 20 years from now, or 15 years from now, and it doesn't matter. But this will be one of those days. So just kind of, like, think about the one word, or think about the caption that brings it together. So when they asked me to speak, and thank you for the nice introduction, I didn't know that when I said, you guys ought to do a TEDx, that they'd actually do it. And that was pretty inspiring to know. Maybe my greatest claim to fame, as was just noted, other than my children and my nephew, Ben, in back, um, that made my, maybe my greatest claim to fame is saying something like that and then have three really amazing students at James River High School actually take my word and go do it. And then 30 days later, here we stand. And so they told me about this extraordinary, uh, how is it, anonymous extraordinary? Thank you so much. Jennifer, you're going to be my, are you Jennifer again? You're going to be my, like, we're going to be like you and me together on this thing, okay, for the next 15 minutes. Is that good? You're my God. You got me? You got me? Like, if I start to fall, you catch. Okay. Got it? Okay. So, um, so I want to talk about anonymous extraordinaries. I'm going to talk about some that I'm going to name by name, and you'll know them. And I'm going to talk about some you won't know by name because I don't know their name. But I'm going to talk about first my daughter. And my daughter, I have two daughters. So I have an older daughter, Grace, by by, and she's seven, and then I have a younger daughter named Lottie, and she's seven too. By two seconds, she's the younger daughter. Two seconds, literally. C-section, she jumped out. She couldn't wait because she's that guy. She's that little ambitious little girl, and there we have these little little midgets that run around my world right now, and it's my little science project, and it's beautiful, and it's gorgeous, and it's amazing, and they're my life, right? They're my children. And so when you talk about these things, and I was talking about, like, I was reading all those beautiful bulletin boards on the way in and, and all those beautiful quotes from all those amazing, amazingly genius, fantastic, whimsical, creative people. And one of them right here in terms is, like, it's a great way to spend life, uh, what is it? It's great, the great use of life is to spend it on something that will out, outlast it. And so I didn't know that I was doing this, but I actually did that. I just published a book about two months ago. It came out, it's at Barnes and Nobles, and it's kind of everywhere, and it's a neat book. It's called Look at More, and it's a really neat book. And we went to Barnes and Noble because my little girls can't get over the fact that Daddy actually has a book at Barnes and Noble. It's just a big deal. Like they, they're they're putting their head around the idea that like Dad has a book there. Like I don't get it. Like I don't get it. And people ask Dad to sign books, and it's all very foreign to them, and they're very awkward in that moment. But then it happened the other day that we were at the Barnes and Noble at Libby and Grove in Richmond, Virginia, and Grace and Lottie are tracking me around. And we walked in and we saw my book. After the first week or so that it moves from the top row, best business books being launched this week, it moves to the next row down, then the next row down, the next row down by every week. And as it sells more, it moves up the ladder again. But mine hasn't had a chance to sell more, so it's kind of on the third row from the bottom. And so it's on the bottom, and Lottie walks by, and she's kind of the, the, kind of the second born, right? She's the second born who's not the, the first born like Grace, like take the mountain and seize it. Lottie's a little bit more sheepish, a little bit more insecure, a little bit more kind of like feeling the situation. But so we walk by it, we see it on the third floor, and I see Lottie's eyes kind of look at me like, what's up with that, Dad? Like, what's up with that's not up there anymore? And I was like, yeah, well, you know, it kind of changes. And I tried to give that intellectual answer to the seven-year-old, but tried to make it really easy. Like, it changes, and it's OK. It's OK. But she could feel me. She could feel me as an author and as a first-time author saying, what the heck? My book should be on the top. It should have spotlights on it. We should have a party every day for my book, right? Because I believe in this idea. I'm so inspired by my ideas that it should be like yelling to the world. And so she could feel me. 
And so we walk back into the back and we sit in the children's section and we read about five Mo Willems books, which are my children's favorite book author. He lives in Brooklyn. He does these great books. Um, you guys ever heard of him? Nuffle Bunny or any of those? You guys are all a little bit too old for that. But read Mo Willems. He's an amazing children's author. So we read all these great books. And then on the way out, we're walking out. And I'm not going to walk by the book section, the business book section where my book is because I just had been there and I was kind of, you know, what's up with my book not being on the top shelf? So I was a little bit put off and Lottie grabbed my hand and pulls me towards the book section, the business book section, and we walk by and she pauses. And I could feel her energy telling me something. Like, I'm not gonna stand it. I'm not gonna tolerate the fact that my daddy's book's not on the top shelf. And I don't understand all that whole publishing thing of moving from the top to the bottom, and it really doesn't matter to me. And this is all that's processing in this little seven-year-old mind. And so she grabs the books and she puts them on the top. She, she has to step on the, top, on the bottom little shelf to reach up and put them on the top, the four books that were. And then she took one of my friend's books, who is a best-selling author, and is, his name's Dan Pink, and he's one of the best prolific authors of today's business environment, takes his books, not knowing it was a good friend of mine, puts them on the very bottom, and she just kind of does one of these. She goes, and she gives me a wink, and we walk off. And as we're doing this, the security guard at the Libyan Grove, Barnes & Noble in Richmond, Virginia, is watching us. He's the security guard, like the, you know, like the mall-looking security guard. No gun, but in the brown outfit and kind of walking around very stoically, and he's there to guard that no one steals the books, right? Well, he sees Grace doing this, and he does one of these. He goes, I see some little girls doing some things they probably shouldn't be doing, but you know what? I think it's good. And he says that to Grace and Lottie on the way out. We get in the car, and I'm driving away, and I'm, I'm feeling all these emotions run through me, like Lottie, one to one, and Grace kind of supported her and held her up against the bookshelf so she didn't fall when she was putting them up. And they were a little team doing this little moment. And we drove off, and I said, so that was pretty amazing. Like, what got into you, Lottie? And Lottie just said, Daddy, you're my daddy. Like, you're my daddy. Like, I, you're my daddy. And that was it. And we drove off, and I thought, this is a great moment for me to give that learning moment, like, say more, say more teach them more, pound this message into their head that they did right, even when they shouldn't be moving books because it's not the rule that, that they broke rules, right? And the guard said, you're doing something wrong, but it's, I'm, I'm okay with it. And I should have talked more, but for the first time in my life, I actually shut up. I didn't say anything. We just drove down Broad Street, and I reveled in that moment. And the little anonymous extraordinaries were in the back, and they did what they felt. They just felt it, right? So they're like, you know... That whole law rule about not moving books and there's even a security guard there and that's like a policeman of the highest order to them, right? The guy with no gun that walks around in a brown uniform, he should be really intimidating them and they're like, ah, it's okay. Because she said, well, daddy, you're my daddy. So there's one in terms of anonymous extraordinaries and that won't be the greatest thing Grace and Lottie does, but it's a moment in time for them to think about how they're going to be ordinary, extraordinary in their lifetime because they did what they felt was right, even if it was breaking a little bit of a rule. And I want to encourage that idea to be a little bit slightly disruptive, a little slightly disruptive because you guys are academic all-stars. You guys are superstars that I'm going to work for one day. It's a big deal to be in this program at this school at this moment in time. You guys are like superstars. And that means that you're supposed to do it all the way it's supposed to be done. But I encourage you to be slightly disruptive and kind of break some rules sometimes and create excuses to do what you know is right in your heart and not what's in your head. That's like a big deal. So the second one seemingly kind of, and, and you know, I think anonymous extraordinaries are sometimes seemingly senseless. They're kind of like, they're kind of like quirky, weird birds that you really kind of don't know what's going on. And so here's one. I'm at the Bugs Life movie. Anyone not know Bugs Life? Anyone know, everyone know Bugs Life, right? The movie about bugs, the Disney Pixar film years ago. And it's one of the first animated films and it's an amazing film. And I encourage my wife and children now, anybody I'm with, friends or relatives, Ben knows this. I sit through the whole movie and then I watch the credits because I think you need to honor the people that put in all that time and passion and all those hours like she did. It may not be documented in 826 hours, but they put hours and lives and months and years into developing something so beautiful for the world. And so you should sit and honor them, right? They're the, ex they're the anonymous extraordinaries. All these people that are faceless just with up there, scrolling by and by, and they made all that that you got to enjoy over the last 89 minutes. And so as this scrolling is scrapping and I'm reading the gafter and the catering company and the director and the producer and the executive producer and all of that, I see this one little thing that says production babies. And it has all these names. 
And so two weeks later, I call my friend at Disney, Duncan Wardle, and I say, Duncan, what was that thing when I saw the production babies on the film at Bugs Life? What did that mean? He said, well, those are all the, all the women that had babies during the period of production of the film. And we wanted to honor them as moms who worked through all of that in order to still have a baby and still keep their full-time job. So we honor those women and those babies through production babies. But the last line of the thing is it says, rolling, scrolling, scrolling, and all the letters get smaller and smaller and smaller. And then the last line, it says, filmed entirely on location. For those of you who get it, it was an animated film. So where's the location? A computer, a bunch of people behind computers, right? But who was the quirky bird that actually sat in that dark room somewhere in California and actually typed in those credits, because that was their job, the intern, right, to type in those jobs, type in those things, and they went, you know what? To heck with it, filmed entirely on location, and they just did it. It wasn't the boss who said, you got to do this. It was them being quirky and individual and, 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 and kind of passionate about what they felt and what they wanted to bring to the world, and they were anonymously extraordinary, because that might have been the finest moment of that 89 minutes to me, when I saw filmed entirely on location, and I'm kind of like a little bit slow. I'm not the fast one. My wife starts laughing outwardly immediately. I had a, like a little like you just did, like, ah, uh, oh yeah, I get it. Filmed entirely on location. It was a film and computers and ah right? And so that's kind of extraordinary in an anonymous way. And then here's another one that just, just absolutely blew me away. And I actually, this is brilliant, right? So you find some things in life and you just walk by them and you're like, oh my gosh, that's brilliant. Like I never imagined it could be so brilliant. And life is brilliant. And there's people out there doing brilliance and I got to find those people and I want them to be around me and I want to love them and hug them and be around them, right? D is that what happens to you? Do you like love them and find them and you hug them? Yeah, Jennifer, you're right. Come on, me and you. Right. Yeah? Yeah, totally. She totally is agreeing with me just to get me off her back. So here's what I found at the coffee shop on Morris and, I don't know, Maine and the Fan in Richmond, Virginia, about two months ago. And it was up on the wall with like the lost puppy and the find the bike and sell the bike and roommates needed and all down by VCU. And it said this, free strips of paper, maybe used as bookmarks, writing down his or her phone number, a healthy snack, a litter, or even a place to put your bubble gum and boogers. And that's all it says, and it's typed on the back of a piece of paper that says, when all the people in the world love one another, then the strong will not overpower the weak, the, the many will not appraise the free, a few, and the wealthy will not mock the poor. So some really pretty intellectual stuff on this side, right? But then this guy was like, you know, it's 12 o'clock, I'm trying to do this term paper of this class at BC to graduate, and you know, I think there ought to be free paper in the world. <laughs> and he did this, and then he went to the coffee shop, and he carried this to the coffee shop, and he printed it off and carried it in his backpack, and walked in and kind of probably looked around and went and stuck it on the wall. And I stole it. I feel bad, but I did. Because it was so inspiring that I thought whoever was getting that free piece of paper, free piece of paper at that coffee shop was not nearly as many people as I could talk to around the world and tell about that anonymous extraordinary that did this. This guy's not looking for credit. He's looking to change the world and be anonymous and interesting about it. Be interested and interesting. Be interested and interesting. Be interested in the world and like see stuff and then be interesting as a result of that and share that with the world. And then the last one I'll share with you in terms of an anom anonymous extraordinary, which is a lot more, well, he's kind of in between, like two people I just talked about, the Bugs Life guy and this guy, I have no idea, right? But Lottie is not an anonymous person to me. She's my blood and soul, my little daughter and Grace. And then there's this other guy named Dr. Michael Kopis. And to round out what an anonymous extraordinary has inside them is they have belief and intention belief and intention. And Dr. Michael Kopis in, this, in the early 80s was driving to work in LA. And as he's driving to work, he gets caught in the LA kind of very, very typical rush hour, and he thinks it's the typical rush hour in LA. And if you haven't driven it, you will get to know it soon. It's terrible, it's awful. You spend your days in cars in LA. And he was spending one of those mornings in LA in his car, and he thought it was just another typical traffic jam, but as he gets on it, he sees a horrific car crash and some people that are in, in, uh, deeply injured, and he's seeing how the ambulances are trying to get to that car wreck in order to save those people, in order to pick them up in the ambulance and take them back. So he's a doctor, so he has a belief and intention around being good and caring for people, so he takes that belief of caring for people and that kind of that, 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 that highest level of altruism and taking care of people and believing in the good of people and taking care of them, takes that belief to the ER room where he's a doctor, and he starts having a conversation. 
And he starts having a conversation with the ER doctors and the nurses and the pediatrics and the x-ray technicians and, and the receptionists and the, and the patients. And he starts to have a conversation. And then he brings in the fire, fire squad and he brings in the policemen as they come into the ER room. And he starts this conversation and he created out of his belief and intention a really, really fierce conversation. Like how in the world do we de better can we take care of those people in order to get them to a safer place and get the medical support faster? So he started talking, and they started talking, and the world started talking, and this conversation actually moved around the world. And it, it started to take place in hospitals around the world, and medical conferences and otherwise. And out of all of this collective consciousness that's around the world, out of it came a really, really cool something, and something that's called Medic One. And when you are kind of driving down the road, or you hear that cuck, 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 the sound of the helicopter in an urban setting like us, it's Medic One. It's that helicopter that flies in and actually brings the medical treatment to the injured as opposed to having to take the injured to the medical treatment center. And so he actually reinvented the entire reference point on how we treat people. You don't have to get them, then get them at the scene and then take them to the hospital. Let's bring the hospital to them and begin treatment immediately. And it completely changed the reference point because he had a belief and intention on what? Caring and taking care of people. Well, the crazy irony plays out like this. He never imagined as an anonymous extraordinary that it would actually play out like this. 12, 15 years later, he's driving down a country road. He, in fact, has a cardiac arrest, hits a tree. A medic one comes in, brings the medical solution to him, and actually saves his life. So how wild and serendipitous is that road of moving from, I had this belief and intention in an LA traffic jam, to 12 to 15 years later, driving down the road, having a cardiac arrest, having my own thing that I thought about actually save my life. And so anonymous extraordinaries are doing things of that level and all the way down to Grace and Lottie just kind of walking out and going, well, you're my daddy. Everything in between, but I encourage you to play that idea out and actually engrave or tattoo those two words to you. Anonymous extraordinary. Because it's not the big of her being on the shoulders at Oprah, it's the getting the Obama thing signed and her watching pictures and seeing it happen in real time. So I encourage you to play that role and kind of jump into the idea of all this because it's really big and powerful. And as leaders, by the way, you guys have a crazy responsibility to do that. Like you guys have a responsibility. How, fact, how big is that to actually be that person and actually maybe change the world in some way? Pretty cool, right? So enjoy yourself in that journey and thanks for having me come give you some thoughts and beliefs and ideas. Cheers.